Hello, in this episode we're going to look at the Malthus model of population and growth. The idea that rising population with diminishing returns is going to result in a trap of low levels of income, possibly called a population trap. In looking at this, we can begin with the framework of the previous episode, namely this general idea and actually seen in some patterns of the data, though it, for different reasons, that over time we would expect to see a first rising and then falling rate of population growth itself over time as per capita income got higher, but this would be the effect as seen in the population growth rate. Now think about the population growth rate as showing a pattern like this one. We're going to really first focus on this part of the inverted U. And in terms of thinking about income per capita, how we might be trapped as a result in low income per capita, it can be useful to compare the population growth rate with the overall income growth rate. So this is the total income growth rate. This is the population growth rate now, and on the y-axis we have some combined growth rates. Now the idea here is that we could be stuck at an equilibrium at this point, at a rather low per capita income. And we can see that because of the relationship that we know between total income growth and population growth rate. First, a reason why we might, a theoretical reason why we might, not at all clear that this holds, in fact it generally doesn't, but nonetheless, this given constant total income growth rate could be the result of a Haridomar model in which nothing changes over time in the sense that savings rate remains the same, depreciation rate remains the same, and the i core C remains the same. And so as a result, over time or as per capita income rose, we would see a straight line relationship. It need not be, but it's just easy to write it down this way because the key fact is that population growth rate in this range is rising as per capita income rises. But remember that growth per capita is approximately equal to, very close to equal to the total income growth minus the population growth rates. So that in this case we have first a period in which total income is growing faster than population and then a period in which population is growing faster than total income. The implication is that we have an equilibrium here. We can argue it in the similar kind of framework as a proof by heuristic proof by contradiction like we did in the Solom model and elsewhere. Namely, this is an equilibrium because if not in this general range, that's important to say, either per capita income is lower or it's higher, but if per capita income were to be lower, then total income is growing faster than population total income growing faster than population, so growth per capita has to be positive. So if we start, say here, we are moving in this direction of our equilibrium 
per capita income. Oh, I'll just call it something Y star. On the other hand, at any higher level of um, per capita income, at this point, the population growth rate is greater than our total income growth rate. And so this is negative. So as a result, it must be that we have negative growth and we're moving back toward the equilibrium. So this is very unfortunate, and it's a way of also describing a Malthus population trap. Something very similar is found in a graph in the textbook with some more reasonable assumptions, more reasonable depiction of some actual income changes, but nonetheless, really, the idea of it can be captured in this simpler diagram that I'm showing you here. So this is a dangerous possibility, you could say. There's a sort of analog to a big push here. If somehow per capita income could reach this point, this would not be an equilibrium. It would be a particular kind of unstable equilibrium, really, in which if per capita income were just to cross this amount, then at that point, as far as we know, ongoing into the future, per capita income would continue to rise. Here as drawn, the total income growth rate remains greater than the population growth rate. And so we could have an indefinite rise in per capita income. Of course, this is a simple model, a, an, certainly an overly simple model. Clearly, in some sense, resources are constrained. We live on a planet of only so much size, but the way most economists think of this is that the um, kinds of products that can be produced with low energy and resources, internet related type kinds of products, video games and so on, uh, really use relatively few resources. So this would be the idea anyway, that at least for some indefinite period per capita income, as we measure it, could continue to grow. So those actually are the two possible equilibria. There's a number of criticisms of this model. One is that the impact of technological progress has been very striking. One thing that it has done is to enable countries to get past this point. However, in addition to that, something important. Is that income growth rates have been able to be achieved at significantly higher levels than before, higher rates of growth than had previously been seen, to a point where one can escape the trap just through productivity. There's a graph in the text that looks somewhat similar to this. It's got a perhaps more realistic shape of also an inverted U above this one, but this very much gets the idea By the way, there's also no current positive correlation between population growth and levels of per capita income in the data. In fact, the countries that are growing most slowly in the world, such as many in, per cap in, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, are those that are currently at a low level of per capita income, also at a high rate of population growth. So that this is the basic um, story and question, can we, in the longer term, escape from this? And we think that we can. But still, we study the Malthusian trap for at least three main reasons. First, many people that one talks to, if you become a professional in the development field, you will find still think that the Malthus approach best explains what's happening in developing countries. So one needs to understand where those arguments are coming from in order to be able to respond reasonably. But second, it's also clear that such problems have occurred. It explains in many ways the um, rather slow 
growth over time of human population and slow growth in living standards. It also is associated with some discoveries, archaeological and others, that in fact there have been Malthusian type collapses of population in the past, such as in pre-Columbian Americas. Third, it's important to know the reasons that the basic model no longer apply, at least at this time, and they can also give some guide to policies that can prevent problems in the future. First, efforts to sustainably raise agricultural productivity. This is what we've experienced in recent centuries. Many specialists have been pointing to slowdowns in global increases in agricultural productivity with some concern, as of course there is continued increase in the population as we've seen. Also, women's empowerment and freedom to choose, along with increases in income, have also led to declines in the old age security motive behind high births per woman, that when you're too old to work, your hope of security depends upon having children who will then um, take care of you. And so, with that, I'm going to leave this episode and we're going to examine how some of these factors can be understood within a microeconomic analysis framework. Those, in turn, give us a way to think about what the most effective policies would be.